Welcome to Brainiac, the science show that stays up way past its bedtime. In the lab tonight, bunging things in microwaves, stuffing your face full of chocolate, and chucking dried food down your neck. Also, we throw Brainiacs around to make them throw up. And, of course, we inflict more mindless destruction on innocent caravans. Brainiac. But first... Can you do your job whilst being electrocuted? Oliver Pluck is a cocktail shaker and maker in a busy West End bar. He's got a well-practiced routine which he uses every night to entertain the patrons of the Roadhouse Bar. Pretty cool, isn't it? But how good will he be when we wire him up? Introduce him to some low-amp, 9-volt electrical equipment and you have yourself an experiment. The current this kit carries produces electrical impulses to stimulate specific muscle groups. And it doesn't take long to throw him off his rhythm. One quick burst of electricity goes straight to the arm muscles, causing them to contract. This results in impaired coordination and immediate spillage. <laughs> the pain also has its effect. Loss of concentration and fine motor skills make it hard for the drink to stay in the glass. And when the voltage goes up, the cocktail goes down. <laughs> in some ways, sudden surges of electricity can actually help with this job. The juddering of limbs quite useful when it comes to the mixing part of the process. Uh, no, no. However, the showing off bit is not quite as polished. Dropping stuff generally considered to be less cool. He fights back pretty hard, but ultimately he knows there can only be one winner when it comes to current versus cocktail. All in all, this show off is a lot less impressive when he's being zapped. Clear evidence that shaken and stirred, making cocktails is a lot harder when you're being electrocuted. <laughs> Hmm. Here's one for you. If one synchronised swimmer drowns, do they all have to drown? Beat them, make you go. Hmm. Well, come on, get on. Go on. Now, this might look like a Brainiac's day out, but don't be fooled, because today we're going to unravel the mysteries of motion sickness. This may well get a bit messy, because this is the science of sick. <laughs> Motion sickness is the nausea, disorientation and fatigue caused by continuous head motion. It's usually experienced as travel sickness, which is caused by the lurching of the vehicle as it brakes and then accelerates again. I'm doing it at five second intervals. So that's accelerate, two, three, four, and then brake again. That's the best way because effectively you're kind of mimicking the rolling of a ship, if you like. Basically, I'm making everybody seasick. But here's the bit I love best. Apparently, as the driver, I'm not affected by it because I know when it's going to break and I can anticipate it and I know when it's going to accelerate so I can be braced and ready for it. Apparently, we could do this all day. The Brainiacs would be sick as pigs and I wouldn't be affected at all. Of course, it wouldn't be a coach trip without packed lunches. Ah, mini scotch eggs, mashed up egg coated in bits of pig. Now that is sick food. The first sign of motion sickness, oh sorry folks, just breaking there, is blood draining from the face. So look out for anyone pale. Might also see yawning and, uh, oh sorry about that one, and restlessness and maybe a sweat forming on the upper lip and on the forehead. And finally, puking. Hold on. Oh dear. One in four people suffer from motion sickness, so with five brainiacs, it's only a matter of time before someone blows chunks. But why wait when there's a way to make them even sicker? It's common knowledge that reading in a car or on a coach makes you feel sick. So, brainiacs, take out your reading matter and start reading. <laughs> 
takeaway food menus. The perfect reading material if you want to get the juices flowing. But there is more to it than that, because as these brainiacs read, their brains are getting confused. Their eyes are telling their brains that because the menus aren't moving, neither are they. But the balance circuits in their inner ears are reporting movement all over the place. The result? A brain that doesn't know if it's moving or not, and a motion-sick brainiac. Oh, there's a yawn, a classic sign of sickness, and, yeah, well, there's no clearer sign than that. There's no doubting these brainiacs really are a sickly lot. But what about me? No sweating, a colourful complexion, I still look fabulous. So there you go, conclusive proof that no matter how badly you drive or how ill your passengers feel, drivers do not get travel sick. Still to come on Science of Sick, why brainiacs hate roundabouts, but five-year-olds love them. Hello, I'm Razor Ruddock, and you're watching Brainiac. The following experiment is dangerous. Do not try this at home. No, really, don't. Paint comes in tightly sealed tins. When the microwave goes on, the heating process starts. The paint molecules are agitated, the liquid expands, till the tin can hold out no longer and explodes. We do these experiments so you don't have to. Do not try this at home. Which is the driest food? Six of the driest foodstuffs known to man. Six brainiacs preparing themselves for a gastronomic challenge. Ahead of them, quite the opposite of their usual liquid lunch. Stand by then, and start. They're crunching down the most arid foodstuffs we can find. Last one chewing, the winner. Cream crackers have enjoyed a long-held reputation for their moistness-free properties. Legend has it that eating three of these cheese biscuits is some kind of Herculean task. But the challenges today are of a far higher metal. China's finest, prawn crackers. Made in Basildon, of course, are designed to suck the juice right out of you. Dried pot snacks, a fairly appalling culinary prospect when they're hydrated, they reach a unique level of nastiness in their unwatered form. Peanut butter, a real roof of mouth clinger, this stuff. Best breakfast porridge, bust in from Scotland with no dairy stop along the way. And ice cream cones, without their usual topping, of course. Each of these foodstuffs has been carefully weighed. They measure up to each other ounce for ounce. Lubrication of the mouth is a vital part of the eating process. Without saliva, it's a lot harder to move the masticated globule into the right position for swallowing. When dry food mops up all the available liquid, the food simply churns and rotates around the mouth, waiting for a bit more juice to send it on its way. It's really down to the nitty-gritty now, with bits of dry gunk getting lodged in all those parched corners of the mouth. And it's Peanut Butter who mops up his plate first. No big surprise, really, with its heavy oil content. It's nip and tuck with the Cracker Boys. Cornet Girl's really going for it. And even Porridge Boy looks confident. And it is, in fact, Prawn Cracker Kid the next to finish. Again, the oil must have helped. And close behind, Ice Cream Girl has also nibbled to a finish. Oh, and he's off. Looks like the peanut butter's coming back. We won't make him restart, though. And Porridge Boy's heroically staggered to a finish. That can't have been much fun. Which leaves the favourite cream crackers against the student's friend, the potted snack. Such dedication really brings a lump to the throat. And surprisingly, Cream Cracker Boy manages to force the last bit down. Leaving potted snacks gurning away seemingly forevermore. Potted snacks then, now officially the driest food in the world.
Will it fizz or will it bang? The regular chemistry conundrum as posed by Dr. John P. Kilcoyne, Principal Lecturer at the University of Sunderland. So, what chemicals has Dr. Kilcoyne got in his shed today? Molten potassium chlorate, sweeties. Will they fizz or will they bang? The answer after the break. Also to come, Charlotte Hudson gets schoolmistressy in the warehouse. John Tickle tries to prevent a hangover and fails. And Brainiacs suffer in the Chamber of Chunder. Welcome to Brainiac, the science show that talks at the back of class. Still to come, Bunhead inflicts more stupidity on the general public. Stand back. And two more caravans face the chop. Brainiac. But first... Before the break, Dr. John Kilcoyne of the University of Sunderland posed the question, potassium chlorate and sweeties, will it fizz or will it bang? The answer, fizz. The potassium chlorate oxidizes the jelly sweet. This reaction releases an instant hit of energy in the form of light and heat. This energy is equivalent to its calorific value when eaten. What a great fish! Nice one, Doc! 47 Second Science. Big science questions answered in bite-sized chunks. Does eating chocolate make you spotty? This brainiac's going to find out. She's got a week of eating only chocolate. By the end, will her face be clear or a mass of weeping pustules? Every day, chocolate cereal for breakfast, a bar or three at lunch, chalky pastries for tea, and a late night licking of body paint. Topped off with a yard of chocolate milk. Your mum always warned you about the dangers of chocolate overindulgence, but was she right? One week, three pounds of chocolate, 25,000 calories later, she's certainly bored of the brown stuff, but is she spotty? The answer? No. Eating chocolate doesn't make you spotty. 47 Second Science. Big science questions answered in bite-sized chunks. Dear John, my great-grandfather on my mother's side was Belgian, which is probably why I've always enjoyed strong continental lager. But, despite my heritage, a night on the tramp juice always leads to a terrible hangover the following morning. Can you find out if there's anything I can do the night before to stop this happening? Thanks. Brian from Ipswich. Well, Brian, I suppose just not drinking in the first place is out of the question. But leave it to me, I'll do my best. <clears throat> Hangovers. Now, a hangover is just a combination of several symptoms. Splitting headache, sore throat, chapped lips. But they all basically share one thing in common, and that's dehydration. So, Whatever I try and do to prevent the hangover, it's got to beat dehydration. I'm going to be comparing three different ways of beating a hangover, using some well-known preventative measures used before, during and after a drinking session. Obviously this means that I'll be needing three different drinking sessions over three different nights, which is quite a lot of drinking. Oh well. Tonight I'm going to attempt to beat the hangover by consuming these before I even start drinking. It's a pint of milk and a kebab. The greasy lining should, in theory, reduce alcohol absorption into my bloodstream, therefore making me less drunk and less likely to get a hangover. To be on the safe side, I'll wash it down with milk for added stomach lining effect. It's a little bit weird, really. One way round. Should be going home and having a kip now, not... Setting down to five pints of strong lager. Nah. <laughs> 